Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. I'm your host, JP John Paz. With me today, back again, very special guest, former WCW World Tag Team Champion. You may know him as Corporal Cajun in the Misfits in Action. He is, of course, Mr. Lash LaRue. Lash, how you doing today, buddy? What's going on, sir? I am tremendous, Paz. Thank you for having me again, brother. This is wonderful. It's such a pleasure to be here. Awesome to have you back. What have you been up to lately? I know you said you're very busy and you're doing a lot of art, doing a lot of lash can draw. Uh, can draw. That's right, man. A lot of artwork, a lot of caricature work. Obviously, in the holidays, that's a big uh, popular thing. A lot of people having Christmas parties, corporate parties, big year-end events, New Year's Eve. So a lot of corporate uh, Christmas parties for that. But also, I was doing a lot of commission work. I was mentioning to you that uh, my commission work has kind of gone through the roof and that's people contacting me directly to have me do a specific piece of artwork, especially for them, you know, poster size, uh, just about any size that you can imagine. That's full color digital illustration. And I've had several corporations that approached me over the end of the year there that wanted me to do their employees. So I had two very, very large projects. One was about 125 employees. The other was about 60. So, I mean, I was knocking out the caricatures during December. I didn't sleep a whole lot at all. That actually is funny because that started in WCW, right? When you were doing Lashing Out and doing the WCW Magazine, right? Is that where the artwork kind of started? Well, it, it sort of, that's where it really took off for me and really became professional. Because I didn't think I would ever be a professional doing that before then, which I never thought I'd be a professional wrestler for that matter, you know. So growing up, those are two things that I never would have thought would have parlayed into professional uh, positions. But the way that they went hand in hand was this, man, is when I was at WCW, I always enjoyed drawing. I had actually tried to sell some cartoons to a few magazines right before WCW uh, opened up for me. In fact, when I tried out for the power plant at the exact same time, I had sent off some submissions to a few magazines. And funny story was right after the power plant accepted me and I began my training, I got a return from cartoons I had sent off to publications six months ago. One was Cat Fancy, you know, six months prior to that, and they bought a cartoon. And the other was the Saturday Evening Post of all places, which blew my mind, right? And I'm thinking to myself, had they been maybe a month earlier when I had said, oh, I'm going to go this route instead of going the wrestling route, who's to say, but it worked out like it should. And we would get to the wrestling shows, man. And as you can imagine, if you've ever been around that environment, you have a lot of downtime, especially if you're doing live TV like we were at the time. You'd have to be in a building at noon for a show that didn't start live until 7 p.m. if it was a Nitro or a Thunder or something like that. And if you didn't have a lot of free tapes to do, or you didn't have a local press or promotional work that you were responsible for, then there was certainly a good bit of downtime. And I began taking dry erase markers with me on the road and I would draw on the boards in the locker room. And my number one fan when it came to that, as a matter of fact, was uh, of all people, Mr. Perfect, Kurt Henning. You know, Kurt Henning was just had a great sense of humor was a phenomenal guy, and he thought this was the funniest, most entertaining thing in the world. So he would goad me on, man. He'd go, oh, man, this is great, brother. Draw draw Hogan. And i go, oh, okay. And I'm this young kid not wanting to get heat with anybody, right? So i draw Hulk Hogan. He goes, I draw him really old. And I'm going, man, come on. Go, no, do it, do it. So i draw him old. Draw him with a walker and an oxygen mask. And I'm going, dude, he's in the other room. And he goes, ah, he won't care. You tell him you don't write the news, you just report the news. And I still use that line to this day, as a matter of fact. When I do a live caricature of this, people will say, don't draw my nose too big. And, hey, I don't write the news, I just report the news. So I would I would draw a little bit of everybody, you know, backstage. And Ross Foreman, and it's funny that we're talking about this because just today I sent out a tweet uh, where I was showing the very first lashing out cartoon I ever drew. And it was because Ross Foreman saw what I was doing in the back. And he was an editor at WCW Magazine at the time. And right away, he immediately saw that, hey, this is a great novelty. This is a wrestler that can draw cartoons. We should put this as a feature in the magazine. And I kind of came up with this idea of doing a single panel cartoon called Lashing Out. 
in the very first cartoon I ever did for WCW magazine and one of the first cartoons I had published, I drew Goldberg, who had just exploded and become a main event star. And, you know, he had the huge traps and I drew his traps so large that they sort of covered up his ears. And there's a kid asking for an autograph. And he goes, I'm sorry, kid. What'd you say your name is? I can't hear you. My traps are in the way. And so, but before I turned that over to the magazine to publish, being the young guy that I was, I was only like 20 years old at the time. And uh, I walked up to him and I said, uh, hey, hey, Bill, I want to make sure that you're okay with this before they publish it in the magazine. And he looked at it and he looked at me and he looked at the drawing again and he went, bro, as long as you're drawing me this big, you could write anything you want to write. <laughs> from, from then on, it was all cool. I never got any heat or backlash from any of the boys for, for poking a little bit here and there, which I was always very deferential to them. I, I never was mean or, or cruel or, or harsh for just the sake of trying to get a rib in there. Uh, I tried to do jokes and gags that were complimentary to them. And uh, it worked out, man. And I never had one complaint, never had to ask anybody else for their permission to publish a cartoon either. Did Hogan ever see the drawing of him as an old man? No, I don't think so, man. And I don't think he ever, you know, gave me a hard time about it or anything else. And to be fair to him, I don't think he would have either. You know, uh, I'll tell you who did see it was Jimmy Hart saw it. And uh, not long after that, Jimmy was doing a program with uh, Mancow for a pay-per-view. Uh, they kind of did a little uh, angle there where they had some heat with one another. And he had me draw a caricature of the two of them going head to head, just in the back a piece of like computer copy paper with a Sharpie and dang, if he didn't take that thing and have t-shirts made out of it. <laughs> yeah. You know? So Jimmy, Jimmy Hart was a big fan of my artwork too, which made me feel really, really good. Those guys saw some talent there in me before I even saw it. And certainly before it was ever as polished as it is now, because man, it was rough then it was rough. Uh, I was able to get by with the fact that it, the novelty was I was a wrestler that could also draw a little bit. Now I take pride in the fact that I think I'm an artist who also happens to be a professional wrestler. So, so rewinding back in WCW, how did you get in? I know it's a very interesting story, but how did you get in? Like, were you always a fan? You wanted to get in? I know that's a very cool story of you breaking in. Yeah, man, it was a phenomenal and, and also shows you just how important timing is, not in professional wrestling specifically, but just in life in general. Because for me, I was a big wrestling fan growing up, like so many kids that were children of the 80s were, you know. And I was right at the ripe age when Hulkamania took off and, and Macho Man and the Macho Madness, man, and Ultimate Warrior, WWF blowing up in its heyday before it ever became WWE. I mean, that was my wheelhouse. And on top of that, the balance of that is I'm a Southern boy, man. I'm born and raised in Alabama and uh, lived here my entire life just adjacent to Georgia, so you get a lot of a heavy, heavy dose of Georgia Championship Wrestling, of Continental Championship Wrestling, or Southeastern Championship Wrestling with the Armstrongs and the Fullers. Uh, you know, Dr. Tom Pritchard was a big part of that, breaking into the business as well. And then not long after that, Georgia Championship Wrestling, slash NWA, slash it becomes WCW. So I kind of grew up on all of those things, but... I had a hard life and I grew up very poor. And by the time I was in high school, man, I was so preoccupied with working jobs. I began working when I was nine years old, playing sports. I played football and I wrestled in high school. And then I was homeless my junior and senior year of high school. So in the 90s, the early 90s, man, from about 90 to 97, I was out of the loop. Or 96 is probably a more fair way of saying it, 95, 96. I was out of the loop of professional wrestling. That was just a, a five-year uh, era in my life where I was simply surviving, you know. And then by the time I graduated high school and I started college, I had some time on my hands again. Life slowed down a little bit for me. I had more control over it rather than just holding the reins. And I had some time to start watching wrestling again. And Nitro had just begun. I mean, it hadn't been very long at all that it had been on the air, WCW Nitro. And about the exact time I started watching was the outsider invasion that would become the NWO, which would blow up. And WCW was doing such extraordinary business at the time 
that they had the commercials on Nitro, you probably remember, for open trials at the power plant. Yep. And like I said, I was a young kid, young know, buck, 18, 19 years old. And I thought to myself, man, I keep myself in decent shape. I'm a big wrestling fan. I probably won't make it, but how cool would it be? It's just in Atlanta to drive over there and go to a tryout. Maybe I'll have the opportunity to meet Sting or shake his hand or see Ric Flair. I have no idea where these guys might live or if they hung around the office or not. I'm just a young kid that's dreaming, right? So uh, I called the number, set up the tryout, went over there, went to an open tryout. It was a three-day tryout and uh, very quickly found out that the way the power plant was wired at the time was it was really, really big on just heart, man. It was heart and determination. It was they were going to put you through your paces, and they were kind of legendary for that. I mean, you had Sarge, who was Sergeant Buddy Lee Parker, that was just a drill sergeant, man. He was a bulldog of a guy that was going to make sure that you were there because you really, really wanted it, not because you just thought you might be the next superstar. And you had Jody Hamilton that ran the power plant, the original assassin, and he was an old school guy. And he liked to see guys really earn their stripes. And so it was not uncommon for people to just drop out or fall to the wayside. And uh, I went, got my uh, physical, took it over there, went to Atlanta, drove two hours from my house to Atlanta for the first day of the tryout and got there and found out really, really, really quick uh, how real all of that really was because you didn't even get in the wrestling ring. Man, as soon as you walked in, they had you grab a five-gallon bucket, turn it upside down, and start doing the squats. And, you know, I'm looking around, I'm seeing guys that were 6'3", 6'4", 290 pounds with abs ripped up in phenomenal shape, guys that had been college athletes but didn't quite make it to the pros or professional bodybuilders or things like that, you know, that thought they had the look, and they thought the look would be plenty, and WCW would see them and sign them. No, I mean, everybody was equal. You know, it was an equal playing field. And I'm looking around and I'm seeing guys dropping left and right. You know, uh, their legs would cramp up or they just couldn't do it anymore. Or they thought this is not what we signed up for. And if they stopped or was not doing the squats, wasn't doing the running in place, wasn't doing the push-ups, the sit-ups, all the calisthenics, if they could not do it, then, you know, the trainers would get in their face and say, hey, you called us. We didn't call you. You can get out of here. And when I realized it was a heart check, I thought, well, man, these guys may run me off, but I'm never going to quit. And if this is about who's going to quit and who's not going to quit, then suddenly I've got the advantage. And I just leaned into that, man, full bore. Uh, the end of the first day, there were there had been 24 guys in my tryout class. At the end of the first day, there were 16 of us left. Uh, the next day, I think eight guys showed up or something like that. Uh, and then the last day of the tryout, and they dropped throughout the day, the last day of the tryout, the Friday, there was two guys, me and one other guy showed up. And uh, wow. after the, yeah, after the first half of that day, that's when they get you in the ring just to see if you could take some bumps, to see if you could run the ropes, just to see how athletic you are. And I don't know what happened to the other guy because then they bring you into the office, they sit you down and they say, look, here's the lay of the land. We're not making you any promises. We don't say that you'll ever be on TV. We're not telling you you're going to be offered a contract. The only thing we'll promise you is you can pay us $3,000 and we'll train you to be a wrestler. I had about $1,500 in savings and the rest of it, I worked off moving furniture around CNN center, you know, and uh, I would drive back and forth, man, from Alabama to Atlanta, five days a week, 10 hours a day for about 10 months before I finally got a break and got a match, got an opportunity to wrestle. I had my first match against Perry Saturn at a TV taping in Orlando and just make sure I was ready when I got the opportunity. And how did it go? Like, were you definitely ready from the power plant? Like, as far as in the ring, in, in TV uh, mode, I guess you could say? Yeah, yeah. I've always been someone that holds myself to a very high standard. You know, probably even beyond what my talents are. You know, I'll be honest. I, I was never going to be the biggest guy. I was never going to be the most talented guy. I was not going to be the body guy. Uh, I wasn't going to be that impressive as of a physique, if I walked out there, people were just in awe. So I knew I had to rely on my technical wrestling and just rely on being a good worker. You know, I really believed in that. And I thought if I'm a good worker and I can have a match with anybody, then there'll be a spot for me. There'll be a place for me. And I'm not going to have an ego about it. I'm just going to be happy to be there. And I'm also a patient person. You know, I, I really, truly believe in life that 
that part of being an overachiever is being willing to put in the time and be patient and wait for that opportunity to come so that you can make most out of a great opportunity instead of squandering a not so good opportunity because you were impatient. And, and I'll be honest, after about six months of training, I, I, I was doing well enough that I could have easily gone out and done some independent matches and had some decent matches. Uh, in fact, I probably could have led a few matches at that point. Uh, and I even had a couple of people come to me that were independent bookers and asked me to work some of their shows. And I sort of held out for that first WCW opportunity uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one. When they came to me, in my mind, I was thinking, well, if WCW isn't offering me a match, then I shouldn't be wrestling yet. I'm, I'm not ready yet. That was just a block that I put in my own mind. And then the other uh, aspect of that was I wanted to be that overachiever. You know, I wanted my first match to be a WCW match. And I don't think WCW even realized that was my first match. But uh, the way things kind of landed back then, uh, WCW would do their Saturday TV tapings in Orlando about once a quarter. They could do about three months worth of tapings for Worldwide and uh, and the other WCW Saturday Night Show over that time. And it was kind of known that you could take your gear if you were affiliated with the power plant or, or knew somebody, and you could get in down there backstage and just let them know, hey, I'm here. I've got my gear. gear. If you need somebody, I'm ready to go. And I did that, hung around, and they gave me a few matches where they were just squash matches, man, where I'm, I'm going out there making the other guy look good, which is, is absolutely fine with me. My mentality was that even in a match where the idea is for me to just make the other guy look like a monster, I have the time through that curtain to like get to the ring, to connect with the fans in any way that I possibly can and leave a lasting impact. And that's what I tried to do. And I, I think that worked. And then the other – plan of action that I had that served me well, I think, was doing what was asked of me, man. You run the play that you're given, and you get in the ring with whoever it is that you're wrestling, and you do what's asked of you, and you make them look as good as you could possibly make them look because that's your job. And when you do that, guys respect you for that, and they appreciate and are grateful that you're helping to make them, you know? And, and so when things when come back around, and they will come full circle sooner or later, and when it's your opportunity, man, they want to help you out the best that they possibly can because they respect you at that point and they appreciate you at that point and they want to see you do well and they sort of pay it forward. And that served me very well. You know, I really believe that. So that when I got some opportunities, people were eager to work with me. So how do you get signed? Who signs you? And what role does Bischoff play in that? Uh, well, you know, here, here's here's the absolute truth on that is it's, it's, a, it's an evolution. It really is when you're on that level. You know, a lot of people just have, I think, fixed in their mind because of whether it's television or just what you see as sports entertainment or what you see as sports in general on the professional level. In your mind, you're thinking to yourself, well, you're just going to go in, you're going to ask for a job, and you probably got an agent or representation. You know, you're going to call and set up that meeting with Bischoff, and you're going to sit down with Eric, and you're going to look him eyeball to eyeball, and you're going to say, let's hammer out a deal. It's not like that at all, especially if you're trying to get your foot in the door. You know, I was at the power plant. I, I, I did several TV tapings where I'm just paid on a nightly basis. I'm going out there doing similar to what my very first match was. And you just keep trying to build a reputation of someone that's easy to work with, can wrestle anybody, and will do anything that's asked of them. And then they're going to want you around. And they had me around and, and had me on, on several TV tapings for that reason making other guys look good, and I was just getting paid a nightly. Simultaneously with that, and then not being under contract while I'm training at the power plant, WCW worked out a deal with uh, EA Sports to do the very first video game, our wrestling video game, that had the motion capture in it. And EA Sports came down to the power plant and wanted to begin to get an idea, okay, how can we film this thing? What's the most dynamic way we can make this work and make it look good? And I jumped right into the ring and started doing whatever they asked me to do while they filmed it. You know, you want to see power moves? I'm a stocky enough, strong enough guy. You know, I'm right under six foot tall, legit. Uh, you know, I can say I'm tall enough. I can say six one if you're putting me in the bill. But I'm probably right underneath six foot, legit. I weigh about 230 pounds, and I'm pretty solid, pretty thick, and I'm a strong guy. I can do the power moves. I can power slam anybody you need me to power slam. Suplexes, belly to backs, Germans, whatever. I was an amateur wrestler in high school and won a state championship. 
So I can do whatever chain wrestling you want to do and make it look legit, make it look tight, make it look good. You know, I can de Malenko this thing if we need to de Malenko this thing. And the other advantage that I had is I was studying what was becoming the big breakout at the time for people my size anyway. And that was that Lucha Libre cruiserweight style. And really, you had me and Billy Kidman were, were the only American guys, you know, people that weren't uh, Mexican wrestlers that were doing that style or could do that style. And so I was studying that pretty closely, just kind of teaching myself how to do a lot of those moves in WCW. And so when they were asking me to do head scissors off the top rope or hurricane runners or springboard moves, you know, I could do them. And uh, they looked at me and they thought, here's a kid that we can hire him to help work on the video game with us. And he can do anything we ask him to do. We don't have to have three different wrestlers to wrestle three different styles. We can have one guy that can do all the different styles. And I'm a pretty good mimic. You know, if they want to put a motion capture suit on me and have me strut like Ric Flair, I could do it. Or, you know, do the Hulk Hogan gimmick or whatever. And they, they were capturing a lot of those mannerisms as well. And uh, as soon as they saw it, EA Sports, to their credit and to my great benefit, uh, loved what they saw in me. And they loved my work ethic. And they loved how hard I was willing to pour my heart into it. And they went to WCW and said, this is the guy we'd like to work on the video game with us. And WCW, my understanding, I don't know directly who this came from, but EA Sports said the office came back to him and said, you would probably be better served to get someone that's already under contract. And, and EA Sports, again, to their credit, my great benefit, said even if we have to pay him, that's who we want. And EA Sports paid me the first few trips I took up there to work on the video game in Vancouver. And so I'd have these long stints in Vancouver working on the video game and word was getting back to the office of, of, you know, how good of a job I was doing representing the company. And at the same time, the consultant that they had on the video game was Ted DiBiase. And I got to know Ted really well. And obviously Ted, for all the obvious reasons, his, his, his uh, experience and his opinion carry a lot of weight. And I would talk to him and I'd pick his brain and, I remember being frustrated one of the last nights we were there and I asked if I could talk to him, you know, after we finished filming that day and after we had dinner, he said, sure. And I came up to his room and sat down with him and Ted's a believer like I am. He's a Christian like I am. And so we have that in common as well, our faith. And so I went to him, uh, trusting him. And I said, you know, uh, I'm really kind of frustrated with where I am. I don't know what the next step is for me. Um, physically, I'm in the best shape of my life. I don't think I could be more prepared to be a professional wrestler for WCW. Uh, mentally, there's nothing that I can learn left at the power plant. I know the moves. I understand ring psychology. I understand all that stuff. The only thing that's going to make me better at this point is repetitions repetition of being in the ring and wrestling guys that are better than me. So I'm frustrated. I'm prepared physically. I'm prepared mentally. I don't know what else I need to do to get a job. And and he said, uh, well, I'd ask you this. Are you prepared spiritually? Because when you get out here on the road, you're going to be facing a lot of temptations and a lot of, uh, you know, that party atmosphere and, and the opportunity to do things that can really ruin your life if you're not careful with it you, and you're not protective of who you are true to your core. So I took that to heart, man, and prayed on it and prayed on it and thought about it. And ironically, and I'm not one of these guys. I'm not an ultra charismatic person. When it comes to my faith, I'm one of those, I, I'm more intellectually driven. I study the Bible. I understand scripture. When I preach and I teach the Bible, that's the standpoint I'm coming from. I'm not overly spiritualizing anything. I think that's an important part of it. Don't misunderstand me. But I'm not one of these, I don't believe God's a genie in the bottle. And you just rub it and he's going to grant your wish. And so, uh, but I prayed on that. And, I, and for that particular moment in my life, man, you talk about timing. I was on the road that next week just doing a TV taping that WCW was paying me a nightly for. And I had a uh, call from my wife that told me that I'd gotten a contract from WCW in the mail. And so, you know, I took a look at it and signed it. You know, it was that simple. And it was a basic, you know, bottom of the barrel, low man on the totem pole contract, which was absolutely fine with me. That's the position I was in at the time. So when you ask about, you know, negotiations with Eric or WCW or anything like that, no, the office just offered me something and I took it, you know, and some of those other conversations don't come until way on down the line when you're in a little different spot professionally. 
So is J.J. Dillon like the head of talent relations? Like who does the contract come from? You know what I mean? Or is that a Bischoff thing? It was more of a more of a J.J. Dillon thing. Uh, when I did speak to someone directly, I spoke to J.J. And again, only had two conversations, to be honest with you. During that same time that I was being a little frustrated, I had gone at one point, uh, Paul Orndorff was in that position. And I went and had a meeting with Paul Orndorff and I sat down with him. And uh, and the internet was sort of in its infamy as, as far as uh, fans recognizing wrestling and putting up tribute pages and things like that. And there had been a few fans that had seen me on the Saturday night shows and had put up these Lash LaRue tribute pages and things like that. I didn't understand it, but I thought, hey, this looks like pretty decent press from the people that matter, the fans. And I actually printed hard copies. That sounds so cheesy now, man, but it's all I knew to do. I printed hard copies of those things, made a file, took it in there. And when I'm making part of my presentation of, uh, I think I'm ready for that next level, I'm saying, well, look, there's obviously some wrestling fans that think I'm bringing something to the table. And I'm just curious whether I have a, a future here in this company or do I need to seek other options? And what, what and impressed me to say, speak, uh, uh, seek other options. I have no idea because I had no other options. My other options at that point was pack it up and come home, you know, but uh, you know, you have some of that boldness and you have some of that self belief when you're young like that, man, and you're ready to make that you're hungry. You're ready to take some risks. And I guess that was a little bit of a risk. That's the closest I really come to making any kind of plea for myself. Uh, they offered me that contract, which I took, as I just mentioned, and it was pretty low. And I found out really, really quick that when you're on the road seven days a week, which I immediately was after I signed the contract, man, they put me right on the road. And if there was a show, I was booked on it. And uh, I found out how quickly you spend a lot of money just on travel and on maintaining yourself you know, while you're traveling. And so I called J.J. Dillon at that point, who was now in that position of talent relations. And I just said, look, man, I don't want to be greedy and I don't want to sound ungrateful when you guys just signed me. But here's the deal. This is what I'm making. And this is what my bills are at home. And this is what it costs me to live on the road. You know, if I can just have this much money at the end of the week after I get through paying my bills and get through living on the road, then I'm happy. I'm not trying to be selfish, but I need just a little bit of bump and pay. And they did not even question it. They got it approved, gave me a bump and pay. And that was the extent of my contract negotiations. Nice. You maybe should have did it more often, right? Go after that. Uh, you know, yeah. yeah, yeah. you look back, and, and here's what I think I have learned as I get older, and you have a different perspective, is – you, when you're young like that, man, you think it's one way or the other, right? You're either the squeaky wheel that's going in there and sounding way too confident and way too arrogant, and you're afraid you're going to rub people the wrong way. And so you're too intimidated to speak up for yourself. You know, you're either that or you're somebody that just, you know, you don't say anything at all. And you just hope that people recognize your worth and they, they pay you accordingly and they, and they give you opportunities accordingly. Well, that doesn't always happen either. And, and so especially in the wrestling business that is so fast paced and they're on to the next thing and on to the next thing. And there's always something new popping up and there's always another talent coming in. I think you really have to speak up for yourself. If you want something, man, you need to go after it. And there's just a way to communicate that without coming off arrogant. You can still be humble. You can still be professional. You can still be appreciative. I just don't think you have the confidence and probably not the experience to do that when you're 21 years old. You just don't. You don't know how to do that. Uh, I think uh, I had said something to somebody recently this week, as a matter of fact, where I said, I was just thinking about my 20s. And I wish in my 20s I had known enough to know that I didn't know enough. Yep. Because let's, let's be honest. I was 20, 21 years old. I'd come from being dirt poor. I slept in houses that didn't have running water or electricity when I was a kid because we couldn't afford to have it. And now suddenly I'm on television and I'm living a dream, and I'm a professional wrestler, I'm thinking I'm killing it at that point. I'm not thinking that there's more to this than this. I'm not thinking that I need to learn the business aspect of the business and not just how to wrestle and how to have a good match. You know, and, and you also think, all right, I've worked hard. I've got my foot in the door. I've established myself. People know who Lash LaRue is, at least in the world of wrestling. So I'm always going to have a job. I'm always going to have an opportunity. 
That's just not the case, man. And it's, and it's naive to think that way, but you don't know any better. So you, obviously you come along, you re, like you said, you wrestled Saturn, Saturday Night Worldwide, you're, you're on TV, you're Mark LaRue. When do you become Lash LaRue? Is this like a dusty thing? It sounds like Lash LaRue, the cowboy star, but you know what I mean? Like, it's, where's, where does the name come from and like, how do you become the character? Well, that, that's all me. That's all me 100%. And, uh, and I'll tell you how it was. Well, let me, let me backtrack that just a hair because I do have to give credit to Jody Hamilton uh, for being just infinitely wise when it comes to all those things that I just mentioned that you don't know when you're 20 years old because you're young and you're naive. He's the wise and God man that has been around and been a man star since the 50s. So he knows these things and he knows how the business works. And because my last name legitimately is LaRue, everybody always has equated Lash with Lash LaRue, almost like a nickname, even before wrestling. When you're a kid, you hear LaRue and you automatically think Lash LaRue. And so I've gotten that my entire life. And from day one of walking in the power plant, Jody Hamilton never called me anything but Lash LaRue. Um, I didn't think in terms of, of gimmick or character or anything when I first went down to Orlando and had that match with Perry Saturn. I was just thinking, I hope I get to wrestle. I'm just trying to get to the wrestling business. To me, that crawl, that's uh, crawling before you walk as opposed to jumping right out there and saying, I need a gimmick if you're going to use me. So immediately, I didn't think that necessarily. However, when I did go down there, that exact same trip, and again, like I said, I've already been kind of informally going by Lash LaRue, but the first match out they have me, Mark LaRue against Perry Saturn, they may have done that for a couple of matches, but I'm pretty sure it's that same trip down there. I met Terry Taylor for the first time. And I don't know if you know Terry or not, but Terry was one of the bookers and may have even been the head booker at the time. And Terry is a real sarcastic guy. Tremendous guy. I've always gotten along with him. Great. There's a lot of people he rubs the wrong way because of his sarcasm. I just took it. At, that's his personality. And that's just the way that he cuts up. But the first time I ever met him, I went up. Uh, he was coming out of the production truck, and I went to introduce myself to him. And, uh, again, I'm not that smart to the business. haven't been around it very long. And this is Terry Taylor. And I walk up to him, and I go, Mr. Taylor, I just want to introduce you, myself to you. I'm Mark LaRue. And he looked at my hand that I put out to shake, and he goes, I'm sure you are, kid. And kept walking. <laughs> and that's when it hit me. I go, okay, maybe Mark is not the best name for the wrestling business. So I immediately went up to him or, or maybe it was the next agent that had a match that, that had my match. And I said, Hey, do you guys care if I wrestle as Lash LaRue instead of Mark LaRue? I'm nobody at that point. I'm doing jobs for him. So they go, we don't, we don't care what you wrestle as. You wrestle as Skip Cofield for all we care. You know, you just, uh, it doesn't make a difference to us. Well, that's all that I needed. You know, I, I immediately took the initiative. I went to the production truck. I knocked on the door. And again, the only thing I know about the business at that point is they're the ones responsible for putting your name on the little banner when you walk out, right? <laughs> so I'll, I go and I knock on the door. Whoever it is opens the door. I didn't even know who they were at the time. I introduced myself to them. And I said, uh, I just wanted the the uh, the bookers, the, yeah, they, they said I could wrestle as Lash LaRue. So if the next time I go out there, you put Lash LaRue underneath there instead of Mark LaRue, I, I, I would so much appreciate appreciate that thank you thank you and just did it just like that man and from then on i was last route. and my mentality was again they're not that invested in me at this point they're just not and i'm not taking that as a knock or or a disparaging towards me they just had bigger stars and i'm this young guy going out there so in my mind i'm thinking that also kind of gives me some freedom again my philosophy of my time regardless of how they book the match is coming through that curtain until I get to the ring. So what am I going to do outside of that curtain until I get to the ring? And that's when I started growing the sideburns out. And uh, I had these big pork chop sideburns because I was a big Elvis fan. And they told me I needed facial hair because I looked too young. I looked like a kid. Actually, their words were, I look like that kid Rudy from the movie. So <laughs> I, grew out, I grew out these big pork chop sideburns. And grew my hair out. And that's when I realized how curly it was. And I looked in the mirror one day and I thought, man, I can shave those sideburns into L's. And so I shaved them into L's. And then uh, I put raging on one side of my tights and put Cajun on the other side of my tights. Thinking to myself, well, people like a Tony Schiavone or a Mike Tanay 
are uh, Bobby Heenan. Man, right away, they're going to pick right up on that. Larry Zabisco, Dusty Rhodes, when they're doing play-by-play, -play, I'm giving them information to call it while I'm in the ring. They don't need me to ask them to do it. These guys have been around. And sure enough, they're reading my tights. Obviously, I'm the raging Cajun. They're going to pick up on that and start plugging me that way. So I didn't have to go to anybody and say, these are my ideas. What do you think about them? And I started wearing Mardi Gras beads just on my own and throwing them out to the fans when I went you know, down through there. So I kind of developed this character as I went. And uh, that's when that's when uh, Jody Hamilton kind of told me before I ever signed my first contract with WCW. He said, let me give you a little bit of advice, kid. I wouldn't worry about trademarks. I wouldn't worry about copyright. Your real name is Jonathan Mark LaRue. Go to the probate office in your hometown, just like a woman that just got married, and petition the judge to add Lash to your name. I wouldn't even change my name. I would just add it to my name. So at 19 years old, 20 years old, however old I was at the time, I walked into the probate office. I had a buddy that was a lawyer at the time that helped me work out the paperwork, paid him 25 bucks, and legally added Lash to my name. So from then on, my name was Jonathan Mark Lash LaRue. It was never an issue in WCW, never came up, was never given a second thought. And then when Vince bought the company and I signed over with WWE, the first contract I had from them is when they had put in the contract, you know, the, all the clauses, necessary clauses that they would own the, the rights and the identity of Lash LaRue with their mentality being that, you know, they bought WCW. So whatever WCW had intellectual property wise, they own now. And uh, I was able to say at that point, you know, it had been my name for several years. So that was my legal name. And they said, really? Uh, yeah. So I sent them a copy of my driver's license. They saw it. They changed it. And the contract had no issues with it. And that's the closest it's ever come to being anything. So I, I kind of balance both those things. There are times in my life now when people call me Mark. There's times in my life when people call me Lash. And I don't wear either one of them one way or the other, you know? Yep. And Terry Taylor obviously calls you Mark, but for a different reason. <laughs> <laughs> they probably wouldn't have just as a rib. But yeah. So when you're in WCW, obviously, you know, you're getting the cyburns, the Raging Cajun, you're starting to have a character starting to get noticed in ring, though. Was it that Billy Kidman match? Was that really what kind of got you noticed and like kind of put you on the map? Like, wow, this guy's a good worker. 100%. Because by then I had been doing those things on Saturday nights. And by then I had kind of uh, not been doing much other than just having good, solid matches on Saturday night. But I've been doing my character and I've been trying to develop this thing and trying to be what I'm. And in my mind, I had already fleshed all this stuff out. Even the things I haven't had an opportunity to do yet on television, I had already done in my mind. My first promos, I'd already cut in my mind. You know, I had all these things planned out and organized. So I knew who I was, even though I hadn't had an opportunity to present it. And the way that it worked out for me was I was at the power plant and I received a call. Um, I think this was around 97, if I'm not mistaken, something like that, 97, 98. And they had put the title on Billy and made him the uh, cruiserweight champion. And it seemed like the direction at the time. I don't want to speak out of school, but looking back, I'm pretty positive. The direction at the time was just this. We're going to build him up and we want to build him up by just giving him good, solid cruiserweight wins with guys that he had good matches with week in and week out. Well, there's only a handful of guys you could do that with in WCW at the time that weren't just luchadors, you know, where he's not just constantly wrestling, you know, someone like a psychosis or which those matches were phenomenal. Don't get me wrong, but just as a nice little change up, it was good to have some variety in there. And they called me at, a, at the power plant. I was there training one day. Believe it or not, I'll never forget this because it's the first call I ever really got from the office. Now, I had had to call the office a couple of times. This is the first time the office called anywhere looking for me. And they called the PowerPoint to see if I was there. And they asked to talk to me. And they asked me if I could come out to Minneapolis on Monday and do Monday Nitro. And that was my first Monday Nitro. I, absolutely. Can I come out? Sure. Absolutely, I can. And so that was Friday that they told me that they would fly me out Sunday or whatever for Monday Nitro. And I flew out Sunday, got there to do Monday Nitro. By then, I was enjoying the fruit of all those things that I had talked about, that attitude that I had kind of mentioned a second ago, which was this. Billy knew me by then. Kidman knew 
what I was, he had a decent idea of what I was capable of, even though we had not wrestled each other. He had seen my matches. He had seen me work. He had seen my attitude. He had seen how hard I worked. He knew I was a humble guy. He knew I was a good guy. Uh, we had, uh, we were friends already by that point, hanging out at shows. And, and also we had mutual friends like Chris Canyon and, and Disco and guys like that. And so he, uh, to his credit, he didn't just treat it like it was some job match, you know, that's good. Some guy coming up to put him over. He gave me a great match and let me have a good match with him. And in that match, not only did I get my moves set in, and not only did he give me an opportunity to do a lot of those things and highlight those moves, but I took the time because I had developed my character already to in between some of those moves, I'm already looking at the hard camera. And I'd learned that much on Saturday night, you know, and going, Ooh, wee, I'm going, yeah. or, or taking the time to stop and look at the crowd and go, I got one in on him there. Did you see that? And I showed just enough charisma and just enough character, I think, to the guys there in the back that were putting the matches together and doing the booking that they said, Hey, this kid's more than just some enhancement guy. This is somebody that, you know, has got a little character and he can have good matches. And that was the turning point. Again, the wrestling business being strange the way that the wrestling business is, nobody pulled me aside and said, kid, you did a great job. That was unbelievable. Can't believe it, man. You are going to be the next big thing. No, they just quietly started booking me. They just quietly made sure I was on every Nitro and every Thunder. And suddenly my matches went from, I'm not just uh, doing a job match for somebody that's a lower card guy on a Saturday night. I'm having a 50-50 match with a mid card guy and still putting them over. Or I'm actually winning some matches against some other enhancement talent. You know, things like that. Or, or I'd wrestle another guy from the power plant and, They'd let me get the win or, or something to that effect. And, and suddenly I could see where there's just a little bit of a slow build and I'm getting some credibility with the fans, which, by the way, I think is an optimal way of doing it if you have the time to flesh that out because you're building up credibility as you go. There's some earned gravitas, if you will, at that point so that if you're given an opportunity and now suddenly they do give you a push a year down the road or two years down the road, Fans have watched you struggle and they've watched you grow and they're emotionally invested in you at that point. They want to see you do good. So then you start feuding with Disco Inferno, then eventually team with him. What's what's it like working with uh, big old Glenn, a.k.a. Disco? Wonderful working with him. Uh, again, the more I sit back and as I get a little bit older, man, and I look and I think, man, I wish I had made much more of those opportunities. I was just happy to have a job. And then I was happy on top of having the job to be put in the mix. And then happy on top of being put in the mix that guys like that wanted to work with me. So I didn't question anything. I didn't add any ideas to anything. I was just happy to be there and happy to be part of the team. I wish that I had tried to contribute a lot more than I did at the time. Um, or I wish I just made more of it. And not that it wasn't enough in, in and of itself. I thought we did a great job. But I think if I would have brought more to the table and maybe been a little bit more ambitious – it probably could have been even bigger than it was. I just saw it as an opportunity. I wanted to make the most of the opportunity that they gave me without rocking the boat and trying to pretend like I'm a know-it-all that knew how to do it better. So with like you kind of moving up the and moving in the ranks, what do you think of the other guys in the cruiserweight division? Because you start getting in the cruiserweight division, start working those matches. It's a little bit of a different style. It, it it definitely, and as far as WCW's cruiserweight division at, at this point, was very high on the like the work rate totem pole. Yeah, I loved it. I absolutely loved it, man. And to this day, I still love it. And I really think that what you're seeing, the evolution of the business now, is really just a hybrid of old school wrestling with that cruiserweight sort of style. And I think that where it gets married at its best and where you see the best matches is when you can bring the energy and the excitement of a cruiserweight match with the old school mentality and drama of telling a story and really making sure your psychology is strong. So uh, it's probably two different answers to that question that you're asking me what it was like to work with those guys, because on the one hand, it was awesome working with those guys. I learned so much. You could be so innovative. Um, just the matches I had with Ray Mysterio, as a matter of fact, we would make stuff up in the ring just because it seemed like the right thing to do at the right time. I probably wrestled him 50 times, I bet, man. And we would do some things that we didn't even know were possible to do 
we just happened to be in position, so we would try it. It would work out because we trusted each other. We both had good timing. We had good cr- chemistry with one another. Same with Hoovy and all those guys. Loved working with them, and I learned so much. And we were friends in and out of the ring. So it was like getting to just play with my buddies, you know? So uh, from that standpoint, it was a great uh, experience. From a philosophical standpoint, uh, there were certain guys that you wish that, you know, the the style was just slightly altered to where, okay, you want to slow down and you want to you want to sell a little bit more. You want to um, milk this move for more than what it is or the high spots. Like a great example of that, I think, which is one of the best moments in my career for getting good, strong advice from somebody that it really mattered, that really stuck with me was I had a match with Ray Mysterio, as a matter of fact, on a house show. So obviously that means we've got extra time. We can go as long as we want. We can do whatever we want. We had a phenomenal match that was just boom, 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 boom. And we came back afterwards, and the agent on that show was Arn Anderson. And I always loved Arn. Arn was so good to me and, and helped me so much and had such an influence on me. And asked him what he thought about the match. He goes, it's a great match, phenomenal match. He goes, but guys, guys. You, you could have done half the stuff you've done out there and still got just as over. He said, you know, you don't always have to work hard, just work smart. Right. And it made so much sense because we would have gotten more out of the match overall from an emotional standpoint. And sometimes that's a hard thing to articulate because you can't talk about emotions. You have to feel emotions, right? But truthfully, you tell me the most memorable matches you've ever watched from the standpoint of a fan. Are they the matches that seem the most exciting move for move? Or were they the matches that you got drawn into emotionally? So then the balance becomes, the tension is, how can I make it infinitely exciting while at the same time drawing that person in so that they really truly care who wins or loses this match? And it's funny too because were you supposed to win the cruiserweight championship or or did you almost win the cruiserweight championship? I remember that that rumor because I think Ray might have been the champion and maybe you were supposed to be champion. I don't know if that was a house show thing or if that was supposed to happen on TV. Yeah, I, I, we won the match once. They put me over in a house show against Ray, and then later on that week we were just in a different town and, and, and flipped it right back over to him. I think they were just trying it out, uh, and then the other. Closest I ever really came to that. So I never got official, uh, you know, any kind of official accolades for winning the yeah, no, title. No that yep. Yeah, yeah, no recognition, no official recognition. Because, you know, by that, in those days, you lived TV to TV, right? And so on TV, Ray was the cruiserweight champion all the way through, uh, which is fine. It's absolutely fine. The other uh, situation where it came closest was, uh, you asked me earlier about Eric Bischoff. And, and what role he might have played in signing me originally and that sort of thing. And to be honest with you, the way the business was structured, especially then, and maybe it's changed some now, I don't know, but you only have, I don't care who you are, you only have a certain amount of energy that you can expand on each part of the show, right? And and, and where do your priorities lie and, and where do you lean into? And at the time, the WWE, and, and, and WCW, the NWO, was, was the business, right? Yep. And so, and Eric was a part of that, not just from a creative standpoint, but then he became an on-air talent as well. And so Eric, or Mr. Bischoff to me at the time, <laughs> was, uh, you know, Eric Eric was always good to me, but I didn't have that much interaction with him. He was always busy and he was the boss. I didn't bother him. I let him do what he needed to do week in and week out. And towards the end of WCW, when there was a lot of if, ands, and buts, and what ifs when it came to who's going to buy what and what's going to happen to the company. The rumor mill was so strong, and it was almost a foregone conclusion that Eric had to put together this group of investors, and he was going to buy the company to such an extent that the last few shows that I worked on, which were not the very last shows, but the last few shows I worked on uh, after Russo's last run, uh, Bischoff was there backstage calling the shots and people were treating him like he already owned the company. And I remember my very last m- show that I had really my last match in WCW actually was again, was that match against Rick Steiner on thunder. And, uh, uh, Bischoff had come up to me and he had walked past me 
that night, as a matter of fact, we stopped doing the MIA gimmick. And I had gone back to just kind of being Lash LaRue, the Raging Cajun, and, and gone back to the tights and not wearing the camo anymore or anything else. And he walks by me backstage and he looks at me and he goes, as he's walking by, he stops and he goes, cut your hair. You look goofy and just keeps walking. And that was almost the most he'd ever said to me. And so I almost being a young guy took offense to it or thought, what do I think about this? And, and I don't know if he read that in my body language or if he just felt bad about it later, but to his credit, he took the time to come and grab me and he pulled me aside and he goes, Hey man, I didn't mean anything about that. Uh, here's, here's what I'm thinking. He goes, uh, during the Russo sort of time there, some of the guys that we really had established as being big stars and being monster athletes and, and being these big top guys, they lost some of their luster because they weren't used in the same way. Or some of these guys, it was perceived that they got buried. And one of the guys that they felt had gotten buried when he used to be such a powerhouse and such a monster was Rick Steiner. And they wanted to give him some of that allure back. And, uh, and so he said, I want to accomplish a couple of things tonight, if you don't mind. You know, I want you to go out and have a match with Rick and just make him look like the monster that he's always been. And that'll give us a reason to put you off TV. We'll do the whole stretcher job thing. We'll take you out in an ambulance. You're hurt so bad that you're gone for a little bit. Come back in about four weeks. I want you to trim up a little bit more. Because hey, the MIA, I got to wear a T-shirt. You know, I didn't have to worry about being strictly a cruiserweight. And so I'd gotten a little pudgy. And he said, I want you to lose a little weight. I want you to lean down. And when we bring you back in, we'll bring you back as strictly a cruiserweight. I want to put the title on you and give you a little run. And that's the only time in my WCW career that anything was ever kind of offered to me or, or, or laid out for me as plans. And I had no reason to not think that that would have happened had things worked out and lined up the way he wanted them to line up. But that was the reason for writing me off TV the way that they did. Uh, that's why I was sitting at home like everyone else when the buyout took place. And uh, then we off into a different direction from there. Just to rewind a second about Rick Steiner, at that point in time, he is looking like a monster. He doesn't like take advantage of guys in the rings, but he's one of the toughest guys ever. And if he wants to throw you around, like if you go watch him versus Vader, Vader doesn't want to move. He literally just picks up Vader and gives him a suplex. Like he's going to pick you up. I don't care if you're 450 or, or 250 or whatever. He's going to pick you up and throw you around regardless. So at this point, it looked like Conan, maybe he stiffed a little Shane Douglas, maybe. Both guys have said maybe not, but it just looked like, especially with you two, it looked like he killed you in that match. Absolutely it did. And and I've always worn that as a badge of honor. Honestly, this is the truth. 100% of, and I, and I mean this, 100%. Let me tell you my experiences with the Steiners. It's my experiences with the Steiners. As, from day one that I walked into the locker room, I always tried to be humble. I always tried to be someone that knew their place and, and was grateful for an opportunity. And I want to learn from those guys. And I treated those guys with great respect because they deserve that respect. And here's the truth. For all the ribbing that goes on, and all the hazing for rookies when they come into the business, nobody ever laid a finger on me. I can remember Disco still getting ribbed by the Steiners because they would be a little mouthy back and forth and things like that. <laughs> Even at that time, they never did anything to me, and they were always good to me. And I always found in the wrestling business, I was always given the exact same respect that I was willing to show. So the level to which I showed that respect was the level I got it back. And, and I can't speak to the type of matches that he may have had with other people, but I've found personally that the guys that can manhandle you are the ones that are least likely to unless you give them a reason to because they've got nothing to prove. What did Rick Steiner have to prove if he beat me up in the ring, right? Everybody knows they can do that if he wanted to, you know? And I went out there and two things that happened, one with Scott and one with Rick, uh, when Scott was doing the big Papa Pump gimmick and he first came out and started doing the Steiner recliner deal, we had a match together, and he went and put me in a Steiner recliner. And I've always been an extremely flexible guy, especially for my size, you know, doing the splits and doing that whole gimmick. Yep. And, uh, and I always had a great bridge because I did amateur wrestling. And when he went to put me in a Steiner recliner, I bridged so hard for him to try to make it look good. If you watch that match, he almost stumbles a minute and has to catch himself on the rope and then kind of re-step himself because he wasn't expecting it to be that light you know, and it looked so good. And I was bent back so far that 
Surge, who was a sponsor of us at the time, the old drink, the old power yeah, drink or yeah. whatever oh, it was. Yeah, yeah he used to drink yeah. those, yeah. Well, they, they did a line of soda cans with these finishing moves printed on it. And I remember being printed on one of those soda cans because that Steiner Connor looked so powerful. And, and they used that for those soda cans. So I took great pride in that, man. And in the same way with Rick Steiner, we went out there, we had a match. And my mentality, again, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, was even if you told me I'm not going to lay a finger on this guy in the match, what can I do to get my character over? What can I do to help tell that story in a way that's unique to me? And one of the things was I asked, I asked Rick, and this was my idea. I said, well, you know, what if I at least to get my character over, we get in the ring. Maybe I don't take it as seriously as I should have. I look at the crowd and I go, Ooh-wee. and as soon as I turn around, you pop me and we're off to the races. That's exactly what happened. And that punch looks like he knocks me out. And from then on, it looks like I'm somebody in a match in a boxing match that has gotten tagged early and just can't get his feet back underneath him. And that's exactly what I wanted it to look like. That's called working. And when you can make it look real, now suddenly the fans are starting to believe it again. And that's when you get stopped in the airport and people say to you all the time, they go, look, I know wrestling is fake, but man, Rick Steiner really knocked you out on that punch, didn't he? No, thank you for the compliment, you know? <laughs> and, and even years later, I can remember, uh, Gosh, this has been probably 10 years ago. People were still talking about it. And there was a, a, a thread on Twitter where somebody was like, took umbrage with Rick Steiner. Go, why did you take advantage of, of a young Lash LaRue and, and beat him up in the ring just to make yourself look good? That wasn't very good. And he even came back. He goes, Lash, I didn't, I wasn't taking advantage of you. But no, you wasn't, you know? And, and not long after WCW was bought out, as a matter of fact, I did a tour in Germany. And Rick was on that tour. They brought him in towards the end of it there. And, and we were actually two of the only Americans there. And when he's wrestling for the heavyweight title, I was the guy that was in his corner seconding him. I've always loved it. Well, I love those guys. I think they're great guys. They've always been good to me. No heat at all. And no residual effects from that match, for that matter. I mean, that was just two guys going out there and performing. That was great because – even 20 years later, I'm still thinking, I was like, I don't know. I think Rick lit him up, but I guess, I guess not. Yeah. No, no, no. And, and here's, here's the truth about that is to me, uh, and I firmly believe this, I think taking a punch the right way is there's, a, there's as much art to that as to knowing how to do a hurricane right off the top rope, as to doing a flying head scissors. Because I can, look, you and I, and there's no kayfabe left anymore in the, in the world, right? So I don't have to sit here and try to protect the business. But you and I can, can have a conversation. I can put you in the ring right now. And if you wanted to do one of those workshops, as a matter of fact, you could pay me $500 or whatever else, and I can train you for a day. And I could, in five minutes, teach you how to throw a working punch. And in five minutes, teach you how to sell a working punch. But what I can't teach you in five minutes, which is inherent, is how do you do that differently? whether it's the beginning of the match or the middle of the match or in the heat or in your combat, it's the exact same move pause, but you're doing it differently depending on where you are in the match. Right? Yeah. If you and I are eyeball to eyeball at the beginning and we're getting intense and we're in a stare off and you hit me, I may not even sell it and I may come back and, and now hit you back. If you can hit me with the exact same punch in the heat. Right. Yeah. Or hit me and I go out and I'm checking my teeth. You know, why would you sell it the same way every single time? And and the circumstances all require something different out of you. Where are you in the match, man? And where are you in this story that you're telling in and out, man? And, and what kind of drama, what kind of reaction are you trying to get from the fans? Are you bringing them up? Are you bringing them back down? Are you drawing them in? Are you getting them on their feet? Man, that's the art. That's the beauty of it. That's the stuff that gets me passionate about it again. You know, that's what I miss is that Shakespeare on the fly, man. And you don't know which one of those things you're supposed to do until you're in the moment. Yeah, absolutely. So just rewinding back to Misfits in Action, because we briefly brought it up, your Corporal Cajun, you know, you make the gimmick shift. Kind of some jokey stuff with UG Rection and and Lieutenant Loco and, and obviously uh, – a wall. I mean, there's a little bit of jokey stuff. Did you like the misfits in action? Did you like the gimmick? Did you like the group? Did you like the name Corporal Cage? Uh, it's a it's a complicated thing because, and the reason why I say it's a complicated thing, if you ask me overall, 
my experience in an umbrella of, of the Misfits in Action. Loved it and loved the guys I was with. So I've got nothing negative to say about any of it. If we want to dissect it, though, and tease it out and really pick apart the elements of it, if you ask me, do I think Corporal Cajun is as strong as the character of the Raging Cajun, then you can do more with it. No, I don't. But what we had at the time and what was laid out to us, which makes perfect sense, and I don't fault Vince Russo for this. When Vince came in and he's riding, he's looking around and he's seen a locker room full of talented guys. And he literally brought us in. And Booker T was involved in this too at the time. He was he was GI bro, right? Yeah. If you remember. Yeah. Yep. And so he brought us all in. He goes, I've got Booker T, I've got Hugh Morris, I've got Lash LaRue, and I've got Chavo Guerrero. And and we were the first few core there. They added Van Hammer at first, and then they came back and we swapped him out with AWOL. But those four of us were the first ones that he sat down and, and had a meeting with us in catering and said, look, here's the deal. I really don't have anything for you. But I think you guys are way too talented to just sit at home. So I can either put you in a group all together or I, and, and, and be able to write one segment that you're all involved in, or I've got to pick and choose or I've got to send you all home. And along those same lines is – when you're telling the same way you're telling a story in a match, and the match can't all be one level, right? It's got to have its ups and its downs. It's got to have its drama, and it's got to have its peaks and valleys. In the same way, when you're writing at a, an entire show, from beginning, from the first match out to the main event, it's got to have its ups and downs and its peaks and valleys, and it needs a little comic relief in there. And they right. told us straight up from the beginning, they go, "Look, you're going to be the comic relief. That's what I. That's what I foresee." And what he sat down, he bro. Bro, have you ever seen the movie Stripes, bro? Go home and watch the movie Stripes, bro. That's what I see you guys being is the movie Stripes. So then when he lays that out, and we know that we're comic relief and we know we have to wear camouflage. Uh, then it became, OK, how can we turn this into something that's unique to us? And that's when we all kind of on our own. Like they threw camouflage at us. They went and bought the same set of camouflage for all of us. Uh, when they may have bought different colors, but we all had camouflage t-shirts and camouflage pants. And out of that came, Hugh came out and he had his cut off like shorts and he had his shirt all cut up and everything else. You know, uh, Chavo came out and he's wearing uh, basically a wife beater version with, with, you know, some kind of emblem on the front of it and, and his, his urban color camo pants. He's wearing a bandana and he's Lieutenant Loco. They hand it to me. I took two different color urban camo pants, took them to the wardrobe lady and said, can you split them up the middle and take alternate colored legs and sew them together? Right. I just felt like that was more my character, you know, and I did that and, and kind of became the corporal guy. Still wore my Mardi Gras beads with it. Still wore my sunglasses. Cut a little hole in the top of the head hat and pulled my hair through the top of the bucket hat, just to be different and set apart. And then as we start working this angle and working this, this, this gimmick together, it starts getting over. And I think opportunities like that really speak to the work ability and the talent of those wrestlers that are involved, right? Yeah, I think it's a huge compliment that you can be given something where your marching orders are basically you're the comic relief of the show, and bro, watch the movie Stripes, and that's what you're going to be, and you turn it into something that's at least memorable for the wrestling fans. Well, again, I go back to saying that's knowing how to work a gimmick. That's just working a gimmick, man. Running the play that was called and making the most out of it, and I think that's what a good wrestler does. And you guys won the tag titles, you and Loco, yeah. a.k.a. Chavo. You beat uh, Jindrak and O'Hare. Doesn't hold it long, and they kind of win it back, but pretty impressive to put that on the resume, WWE World Tag Team Champion. 100%, man. And, again, it goes back to how ironic it is that uh, uh, for all my long – my longevity was probably in the cruiserweight division. Uh, certainly the bulk of my matches was in the cruiserweight division. Uh, certainly what I'm remembered for most is being a cruiserweight wrestler. And yet I never officially held the cruiserweight title, but I held the tag team titles, the world heavyweight tag team title. It, it's, it, that's just the wrestling business, you know, in a, in a nutshell. So it means more to me now, uh, looking back on it and being able to say that uh, something that was as historical as WCW was more than it meant to me at the time. And I say that not because I took it for granted, but because at the time, I was very hyper aware of the fact that, hey, I'm only getting this opportunity because this is what they put on the paper tonight. Yeah, I didn't beat anybody. 
And, right. And in the same way that Rick Snyder didn't go out there and take advantage of me and he didn't really knock my teeth out, I didn't beat anybody. Um, it, it's just uh, it, it's the way that it's worked out tonight, and this is what's good for business, and, and I'm benefiting from that. And, hey, wonderful, this is great. But I'm not going to act like I'm better than somebody because of it, or I'm not going to act like I really won some trophy. No. It does say a lot. There are certain moments in a career that are defined by things like that because it is the equivalent of winning an Oscar or something where your peers are recognizing that you've arrived in a special place. You know, And I think that sort of thing is maybe reserved for an intercontinental title or the U.S. title or the heavyweight championship title. Outside of that, most of it is, is kind of a prop, you know? Yep. So what did you now think with, of Russo? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, with that being said, though, I will say this very quickly. I do think it's important to walk that back a little bit and say you can't always treat the belt like it's a prop, though. Because if the belt doesn't mean anything to you, then what are we even wrestling for? And if it doesn't mean anything to you, it's not going to mean anything to the fans. And if it doesn't mean anything to the fans – then they're not going to be emotionally invested in a match that you're having for a title that doesn't mean anything. Good point. But, you know, speaking of titles or props, what do you think of Russo, bro? I think he's great. I think he's wonderful, man. And, and the reason why I'll say that is, is twofold. Um, pardon me. Um, I, I say that I say that because, first of all, when he came in to WCW right away, he had certain guys that he kind of had an eye on and that he thought were talented that he sought out. And he specifically said, look, I can see us doing something with you and doing some good business. And I happened to be one of those guys and I benefited from that. And it was the first time in my career that anybody with any kind of substantial leverage or pull took some time to talk to me about my career and what the future might look like. So I greatly appreciated that. I also appreciate the fact that he's a very creative guy. He's a very creative guy. And he comes up with some good ideas, and um, and there's no denying the success that he's had in the wrestling business. It's not easy to write these wrestling shows. Uh, with that being said, you know you can't sit back and say all the critiques that he receives that some of those aren't aren't merited. Uh, but uh, you can say that about anybody at any given time. And I think it, again, it goes back to speaking to you need the Russos in the wrestling business. You need the Kevin Sullivan's in the wrestling business. You need the Eric Bischoff's. You need the Dusty's. Now, all those guys are going to upset somebody at some point, and there are going to be plenty of people to criticize them and be negative because they're the ones that happen to be in that position and have the pencil and have the book. But with that being said, overall, when you look at the, uh, the landscape and the tapestry of work that he's put together over the years, uh, you know, that's something I'd be proud of if I was Russo. It's funny, though. All the bookers, like Dusty, he says baby. Russo says bro. Sullivan says brother. Right? All these bookers have these one-word B words that they love to use on the guys. Weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's funny you say that, but also everybody kind of has a variation of that anyway in the wrestling business. And, you know, I never picked up bro until – uh uh, until I got into the wrestling business, and even now, I've been I've been retired from wrestling, been out of the business for over ten years, and I will still call people my brother. You know, I say, like, "How you doing, my brother? It's good to see you, my brother." Yeah, and yeah. it's one of those things from the business that sticks for some reason. And uh, not to get too far in the weeds on it, or or pound a dead horse, but I, I think a big part of that is just because it's the nature of the family that's in it. I mean, it's a fraternity. And you can be out of the business for 20 years. And if you ever earn, had earned the respect of the other boys before you got out of the business, then you're still going to always be one of the boys. It doesn't matter, man. I, I could run into one of those guys now, and I have. I've reconnected with a lot of those guys really in the last quarter of last year after being a ghost for about 10 years and just hiding out and nobody ever hearing anything from me. Um I'm getting older now, man. I'm getting sentimental now. I'm calling on some of those old guys, and I'm going, you guys meant something to me at an important part of my life, and I will tell you how much you meant to me, man, and I'm not afraid to share some of those emotions with you, and, and I don't want to live the rest of my life not having the opportunity to revisit some of those memories and not be able to tell people to their face that they mattered to me at a point when I really needed people to matter to me. So WCW, you know, 
through your time, they're the best. And all of a sudden, they're not the best. So a lot of political stuff, a lot of maybe bad booking decisions, a lot of just craziness coming down from Turner, uh, standards and practices getting involved. I mean, there's so much going on. What did you think about just the backstage, maybe even politics or the goings on of you see the 83 weeks of dominance and then you're seeing the, the collapse of the Titanic kind of sinking? Well, you know, I, to be fair, to be fair, for the longest time, I always kind of had this youthful innocence about me where I would do interviews and people would ask me about it. And, and I would honestly and legitimately say, man, I just didn't see it. And I don't understand it. And it, it doesn't make sense to me. And it doesn't compute. As I get older and the perspective on life in general has changed and my experiences have fed into that. And I know what's real uh, as far as what happens in certain circles. And I can look and I can see I benefited from the fact that I was low on the totem pole. And what I mean by that is a lot of that stuff didn't touch me in the same way as it would a main event guy. You know, right. um, I'm going out and I'm having great matches every night with people like Crowbar and, and uh, Hoovy and Ray Mysterio and Kidman and those guys. Uh, I'm working with Lenny Lane and Lodi, you know, and I'm great and enjoying every bit. Of Alan Funk and Mike Sanders and these guys. And so we're in a different sphere than somebody that when having to negotiate the egos that might be involved in a main event between Jeff Jarrett and Hulk Hogan. Right. I mean, that's just the truth in, in, in of the matter. So all I have to do is show up at work, be told what to do, make a, make a good living, being a part of something that's really, really special. And I also don't have the pressures of an Eric Bischoff and wondering, okay, how is this business going to uh, make money and how are we going to keep it a business as opposed to it being sold off to a different corporation or being parsed out or just ceasing to exist? I didn't have to worry about the pressure of how are we going to get these uh, ratings up a couple of points next next week because I wasn't the main event guy. I wasn't the main event guy. Uh, but looking back, I can see where some of those things were starting to happen. I can see where some poor decisions were possibly made. But I also think that WCW overall was just a victim of a hyperspeed business. And what I mean by that is this. You go back and you take the worst Thunder shows, the worst Nitro shows, even when WCW was quote unquote in their dying days. And I guarantee you there's a lot of wrestling companies that would kill for that today. Yeah. They would kill for those same numbers. You look at the houses we were drawing at the time and you ask impact or you ask, uh, you know, NWA or you ask uh, even AEW if they would like to have the same crowd we had the last time we were in the, you know, the, the New Orleans Silverdome, you know, Superdome or something. And I guarantee you that they're, what the answer would be. So I look back and, and I don't think it was the doom and gloom that it was. It was just we were a victim of our own success. It was such a contrast compared to what the, the really, really, really good years were that it looked so, so bad in comparison. But if you compare it to where the business was 15 years later, Anybody would take that, man. They said, give me that business model all day long. Yeah. So it's a matter of perspective. It's funny, too, because if you look at even WCW Saturday Night ratings towards the end of the run, AEW would kill. It was like in the millions. They would kill for that. Yeah. It's, it's exactly what I mean. And, and so it's just the landscape changes. And, again, I'm not – hey, I'm not knocking what the business models we've got going on today. I see some exciting things available and on the horizon. Um, I feel optimistic about the business as a whole on the landscape, more so than I have in years. It's even piqued my interest again. And for the longest time, I had lost sort of my passion for the for the wrestling business. And I look and I see some a, a bit of a renaissance in wrestling. And I like that. I love that because it's such a beautiful sport slash entertainment slash business. Uh, it, it's just a different animal, man. And I like to see it doing well. Uh, but with that being said, we reached so many households in that era of the late nineties, early two thousands, man. I, I would argue, and I'm not just saying this to pat myself on the back or to build myself up. I would argue, take anybody that was on my level, not just me specifically, but on my level and on my placement of the card. And they were probably better known in that era among uh, the general culture than some of the main event guys are now, you know, as far as name value and name recognition are concerned. No doubt about it. And it's it, just yeah. because 
it was, so, you know, the media was just so powerful at the time. You know, what we were on and the, the channels we were on and, and the, the number of people, the eyeballs that we reached, you know. Yeah, it's crazy. So with you, Vince obviously ends up buying WCW. There might be some controversy because he bought it so cheap compared to what Bischoff and Fusion Media offered. So there's some controversy there with Brad Siegel and Stu Snyder on the other side. I don't know if you're familiar with some of that, but did you ever think like, wow, WWF, first of all, shockingly, Vince buys WCW, but they bought them way too cheap, $4.5 million, whatever it was. I mean, crazy cheap, especially if somebody else yeah. offered you $60 million. Yeah, a lot of that stuff came to light for me, you know, a few years later. Um, obviously, I wasn't contemporaneously aware of everything that was going on. I wouldn't have been in the know at the time. And I probably would not have been sophisticated enough on the business end of wrestling to have really made heads or tails of it anyway and be able to parse it out. But from a talent perspective and seeing it all happen, it just seemed unfathomable. Because, again, I didn't have the business mind when it comes to wrestling. But I tell you what I did have from a common sense standpoint is I'm thinking to myself, no matter how in the tank we may be right now as a wrestling company, how are we doing worse than say the Browns at the time? <laughs> you know, right, and I'm right. thinking, uh, you know, I'm thinking to myself, now you took just for the sake, and I don't mean to pick on them, but for the sake of argument, you take an NFL team like the Browns, their salary has to be way higher than what wrestlers are getting paid. Uh, they only have a 16-week season, and then they have an off season. So they're only getting drawing that revenue from games and that sort of thing for 16 weeks out of the year. We're year round. We've got all these merchandise sales that are going on. We have all these TV revenue. We don't ever have an off season, and uh, we're selling out gates. Where you know, I just from my standpoint, from a business standpoint, I didn't see how we were not making money, or at least enough money for our business. To, to continue going. So I, I just could not see in the end, I guess in my mind, I, I could foresee there being a change in the dynamic and the structure of the leadership, but I could never see WCW going away, if that makes sense. I could not fathom that or process that until it happened. And then after it happened, you know, I, at the, I had enough confidence in my ability and then my talent and what I brought to the table for the scale that I was getting paid at, that I figured I would always have a job. You know, uh, I came from that school of thought that if you're a good hand and you could have a match with just anybody, then there will always be a place for you in the wrestling business. You know, that's that Armstrong mentality. And, uh, and those were the guys I gravitated towards. I wasn't as impressed. I was always impressed and appreciative of everybody I could learn from. But I was far more impressed with the guys that put food on their table for 20 and 30 years straight in the wrestling business through the good years and the bad years and the lean years and the fat years and were just steady and consistent. That impressed me more having a long career than somebody that was a flash in the pan was a big star for six years. So I leaned towards wanting to be the, the former part, not the latter part. But uh, so I, I couldn't fathom not having a job in the wrestling business. And I was so, ill-equipped for it. So where'd you end up, though? Like, obviously, Vince buys WWE. You, did you go down to Heartland? You went down to HWA? Like, did you have to meet up with JR and Johnny Ace and kind of go over a new contract? What ha happened? I know you were saying before, obviously, you, you had to tell them, Lash LaRue is my name and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, it was a, it was a difficult situation for me because um, at first, everything was up in the air for me. I had no clue what was going on at all. Um, I watched WWE purchase WCW just like everybody else did live because I was sitting at home. And once it happened, nobody really had an idea among the talent that spoke to one another, rather. I would say my buddies and my circle of friends, nobody knew what was really going on. And so you get little rumblings here or there, and then you know, okay, well, Vince bought the company. What is that going to look like, and what does that mean for us? Then we find out that, that Johnny Ace – was going to be sort of the talent liaison in the transition there for the WCW guys, especially, and maybe even be groomed for a position that he would later, you know, wind up in as, as uh, the talent relations guy. And Johnny would call me up at home and, uh, you know, he called me up and he said, Lash, yeah, Johnny, I got some good news. And I got some bad news. 
Okay, Johnny, I'm a tell me the bad news first type of guy. Tell me the bad news first. And he go, well, the bad news is that this is only interested in 24 guys from WCW. Okay, I understand. Well, that's good. He goes, well, the good news is you're one of them. All right, that's wonderful. What do I need to do? Well, just sit tight. We'll, we'll get back with you in a couple of weeks. So I sit tight, and I sit at home for, for about three or four more weeks, and then they called me up. And uh, they said they were just going to keep my same contract that I had with WCW at the time, and Vince had just assumed that contract. Then they called me up, and they said that Vince wanted me to go to Cincinnati, to Heartland, and help train some guys up there is the way it was presented to me. Because I was an established talent at that point in WCW. You know, I wasn't coming out of the power plant at that point. I'd already been on TV for a while. And uh, they wanted me to go up there, help train some guys, and quote-unquote knock the ring rust off until they had found a way to write me on the TV in WWE. And that's just the exact way I expected it to play out. I, I realize now, given all the talent that was kind of an influx in the WWE at the time, and all the talent that WWE already had, had it's extremely naive for me to think that that's what was going to happen. But, you know, I had a good run at WCW. I felt good about where I was at. And I really, really thought that would continue. I didn't have heat with anybody that I knew of. Uh, they had a meeting in uh, Atlanta where JR flew down, who was extremely gracious and very kind and very good to me. And we all met individually with JR. And we'd go in and we'd sit down with him. And he was just getting to know us and just talking to us and, 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 you know, what we thought going, I think they were just filling us out more than anything else, you know, and he filled me out, found out a little bit about me. And I felt like I had a pretty positive meeting with him, went home. And uh, that's when they called me about a week later about going to Cincinnati. And then they called me uh, uh, right before I was about to leave for Cincinnati. And they wanted me to sign a new WWE contract because the style of the contract was different. You know, WCW, you got a guaranteed downside. And that was not, not guaranteed downside. You just got a guaranteed contract, you know, and for most of the guys. And that's what you're going to make throughout the year, regardless of how many shows you worked. And the only extra you got to the top of that was uh, off merchandise and video games and things like that. So that's what I was accustomed to. And that's what I was under, you know, uh, way it was sold to me. And I was about to cut into my third year of that. So I was about to roll over into a, making some good money for the first time. And they called me and said, Vince wanted me to sign a new contract that was a WWE style contract. I would take a huge pay cut. Um, but in the end, I was a workhorse, right? I was the guy that was booking every show at WCW. So because of the way that their contracts were structured, if I'm booked the same way in WWE that I was booked in WCW, I'm going to make more money at the end of the year. Yep. So that's what I'm looking towards, which also my mentality was this. And I said to them word for word, I said, look, I'm not greedy. If I can live my dream and pay my bills, I'll sign whatever you guys want me to sign. You know, and I did. I signed a WWE contract and it was a talent contract. It was not a trainee contract. Um, I didn't know that there was a difference at the time and I didn't think it mattered at the time. But then they sent me up to Cincinnati and I was under the impression I'd be there for about four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, maybe. Man, I wound up being there for nine months. Wow. And I was not, I was, I was too young and naive to realize that, hey, I need to show them something before they're going to pull me out of here. I thought that, hey, it would just be what they told them. My mind, they already know what I can do. And when they're ready to bring me up, they're going to bring me up. I didn't think in terms of, hey, you're starting at zero again, and it's time for you to prove yourself. And you better show them that you're the cream of the crop down here so that they'll want to bring you up to the top. I didn't think the business worked like that at the time. I look back now and I realize it's naive, especially in the early 2000s when you've got as much talent as you've got on that roster. But, man, I just didn't know any better. I didn't. And so I allowed that time down there where I felt like some promises maybe weren't kept or I wasn't being treated the right way, or I've taken this huge pay cut, and now I'm away from my family, and I never get to go home, and I never get to be around them. I'm on the road now more than I was in WCW, and I'm making half the money is what I'm thinking in my mind. And that stuff starts building up some resentment and bitterness. And it's hard for you to turn that into a positive and utilize that to try to become a better talent so that they'll want to bring you up and that you can make it in. So it becomes this vicious cycle, right, if that makes sense. And you get stuck in a bubble 
you get stuck in a bubble when you're when you don't really have any clarity. Now I'm an older guy now. I got a different perspective, and I realized I probably could have fixed a lot of that thing with a lot of those problems with some phone calls to the right people. You know, having some sit downs and some heart to hearts with people that would have been sensitive to me, and they would they would have cared, and they could have at least pointed me in the right direction. But nobody was giving me any direction at all. I was looked at like I'm a veteran at that point because I'd been through this very this very unique time in WCW's history I was a part of. So I'm looked at as I'm a veteran. And I think people thought I'm a little bit older than I am. Dude, I'm stuck down there at probably 23, 24 years old. Yep. I'm a kid. I don't have a clue. Yeah. I I was born dirt poor in Oxford, Alabama. Well, raised by a mom that quit school in the eighth grade that had five kids, and I never knew who my dad was. Yeah, I, I was ill-equipped for knowing how to navigate those types of waters. Right. I just was not uh, sophisticated enough from a business standpoint, uh, from a ways of the world and experience standpoint. So I got, I got chewed up a little bit, to be honest with you. And I didn't know how to take that. It put a chip on my shoulder. And uh, I feel like I could handle that I'm a lot better. Uh, I think that it's easy for guys in that position to sit back and I can come on a podcast or I can do a shoot interview and I can point to all these promises that weren't kept by a wrestling company or I can blame the promoter or I can blame this talent guy or this agent. Uh, you know, reality, you just, you're thrown into a situation that you're ill-equipped for. You don't know how to navigate the waters. Nobody's got any ill intentions. And, and I certainly wanted to make the most out of the opportunity. I just didn't know how to. And because of no communication, everybody winds up leaving with a sort of a bad taste in their mouth for no reason. And it didn't have to be that way. And I squandered a lot of my prime years. That could have been some of my best years in wrestling. And I feel like uh, a lot of my career is that is a lost generation of unearned potential there. You know? And I've had this conversation in the last few months with some other guys that went through the power plant with me, you know, and I feel like there's a, because of what happened in the wrestling business overall, there is a generation of lost wrestlers that were very, very talented, very good workers that we won't be able to have ever seen the best of what they could have been because they didn't have the opportunity uh, or the place to go to really exhibit those talents at the time. And I feel like something has lost between that generation and today's generation of wrestler. I don't know. It's, there's just something not there. It's it's not necessarily the charisma, but it's like, I don't know, knowing to look at the camera like we used to do. Like the, you know, just the simple stuff that we almost took for granted as fans. It's like, oh, everybody's going to be able to do that. Nobody does that nowadays. There's even top guys in certain companies that don't know where the camera is which just it's nuts to me because you know like you got that ingrained in you right i mean it's just it's a different business now and it's kind of i don't know uh not as good as i guess you could say as it once was well here's what i think in all honesty and i think this is why that generation matters you can say well we just skipped over your generation last and what's the big deal and so maybe we've got a gap there maybe we've got a lost generation but what difference does it make is we are where we are now and there's plenty of talent in AEW and there's plenty of talent on Impact. And we see these guys coming up that's going to be the next big thing. And WWE's got some good guys coming down the pike. And so what's the big deal? Well, I'll tell you what the big deal is. I feel like part of the magic of WCW and really part of the magic of what you've seen WWE accomplish through the years is there's always been a healthy mix of generations and a good locker room, right? In a good locker room, You've got your top main event established guys. You've got your people like your Sting. you got your lifers. you got your Hulk Hogan's. In WCW, we had our Ric Flair's, our Hulk Hogan's, our Lex Luger's, our Arn Anderson's, these guys that had been around. And then you had at the bottom underneath all that coming up, you had your Ray Mysterio Jr.'s and you had your Eddie Guerrero's that were coming into their own and Booker T's and you had your Chris Jericho's and you had your Chris Benoit's and you had your Dean Malenko's. And, and even after them, you had me and you had your Disco Inferno's you had your Chris Canyons. In between there, you had your journeyman guys. You had your Bobby Eaton's. And you had your guys that had been around. You know, you had your, your, your Dutch Mattel's. And you had your uh, Rick Martel's. And you had your, uh, your Greg the Hammer Valentine's. 
and you had your Jim Nodhards and you had your Armstrongs, you had your uh, your Bobby Blaze, you had all these unsung heroes, guys that had been around and they had seen everything and they had experience. Your Bam Bam Bigelows, you know, and they were they were the guys that when you came through that curtain after your match, they would pull you aside and say, "Hey, kid, next time you grab that rest hold, make sure you turn the guy to the hard camera." That's where you learned it. That's where you learned it because your top guys, like if you're in WWE and John Cena's at a show, he probably doesn't have time to pull you to the side and tell you that. He's too busy being John Cena, you know? And then you got your underneath guys, your young guys, they don't know it any better than you know it. So you need those guys in between those Bobby Eatons that are watching a match and, and they just very nonchalantly when you come back tell you the little small things or your Arn Andersons will tell you those little small things or your Ted DiBiase's. And these guys that have been around, man, and they spent a little time with you. And you ride in the car with a Nick Patrick or a Brad Armstrong or Tom Pritchard. And you can have these conversations. And that's where you learn, man. That's where the proving ground is. And you don't have that middle ground generation anymore. I, I don't see that many of them. I mean, you've got a couple. But you don't have that many of them that are in a position where they're not carrying the load of carrying the company. And they're not the new, young, fresh guy coming in. They've got the time to stop and spend some time with you, but they're still young enough and they're still hungry enough and they're still athletic enough that they can have good matches with you. Jerry Lynn can go out and have a, you know, when I was coming up, Jerry Lynn can go out and have a match with me. Chris Candido can go out and have a match with me and I can learn on the fly while I'm going through all that. You know, um, a lot of those matches that I had on Saturday nights that look like they're just enhancement matches, man, those aren't enhancement matches just so that you can build up some credibility and build a name for yourself. Those are enhancement matches with the guys that are on their way out the door that can teach you something on the way. Right. That's invaluable, man. That is so invaluable. And even like the Stevie Richards of the world and like those guys from the, the early 2000s, Hardcore Holly, Al Snow, like even yes. those guys that are great hands, you know that they know everything about the business. They've been everywhere. They've traveled the world. They've, they've wrestled for a million different companies. Like those journeyman kind of guys that are that know everything and are, are just pro wrestler personified, there's none of those guys around anymore. It's crazy. And it's just like this guy doesn't get better from wrestling a guy his same age. And like like WWE always does that. Put two guys out there and like, oh, that match stunk. Or, wow, that guy didn't get any better. Hello, he's not like like Lesnar was working with like a lot of these guys that were helping him along, whether people realize it or not. Like you, they don't have that anymore. It's crazy. That's right. Well, and, and part of it again is is it a generational thing? Because here's the thing: if you want to put him out there with somebody that's experienced, then it's got to be somebody that's older than me, because right. my generation got lost, right? And if you put him out there with somebody that's young enough to kind of go on his level and be able to have a good match with him. He can be as athletic as he is and match him move for move, then he's going to be just as inexperienced. That's where that sweet spot is. And you need those guys that can be locker room leaders. And which, by the way, is not just about what you do in the in the match. And this is one of the things I think AEW is doing well and doing right. Is it seems to me that they've got a few Chavo Guerreros and a few Jerry Lynn's in the back. That, you know, they may not be out there having matches week in and week out with these guys, but at least they can be in their ear. And at least they can give them some invaluable uh, experience in, in, in advice and encouragement. And again, that can be just as important as, hey, this is how you grab a headlock the proper way. Be because, man, what I would have done to have killed for somebody that could have been in my ear at a time when I needed it most to say, hey, I understand why you're struggling psychologically with this aspect of the business, but it's going to get better. And hey, this is what the way out looks like. And this is where the light is at the end of the tunnel. If you'll hold on for another six months, they're going to do something with you. Or if you hold on for another year, they're going to do something with you. And it's going to be worth it. I promise you. I didn't, you know, who, who, who out there can, can, can travel the roads with these guys and do that sort of thing anymore. And what it's done then is, is not only have you lost this generation, you've lost this generation, my generation at a time when they're really not that far past their prime. That's the other thing yeah. about it. You know? Yep. I mean, I, when, when I come on your podcast uh, and, and we have these conversations, Paz, and you and I, even when we have the conversa conversations informally, I feel like the old guy at this point, right? Because we're talking about WCW. 
We're talking about something from 20, 25 years ago. We're talking about that being the prime of my wrestling career. Dude, I just turned in November 45. That makes wow. me the same age as the WWE heavyweight champion. Yeah. That makes wow. me the same age as AJ Styles. That makes me, I think, unless I'm wrong, younger than Edge and Christian. <laughs> you know, it certainly makes me younger than Chris Jericho. You know? Yeah. Uh, so there, there's a lot of that. Um, regret is not the right word for it because I don't believe in regret. Life takes you in the directions it takes you for a reason. But there are a lot of what ifs. You know, there's a lot of what ifs. Think about it, too. A lot of the guys that are the main event guys are all older. Not really Reigns. I mean, he's in his mid-30s, but like 40 and above. Like Danielson just went to AEW. He's 40. Punk returned. He's 44. Like, you know, all these yeah. guys are older. Samoa Joe is 40. Like, all these guys are older. Well, and I think that there's a reason for that, too, though, is you need some seasoning in order to go to that next level, you know. Um, that's another reason why I lament some of the years that I missed is because – Man, I feel like right now I'm better equipped, even now being out of business for 10 years, of walking out there on live TV and cutting a promo now than I would have been when I was 22. Because I didn't have the perspective and the experience to be able to articulate what my feelings are to take people on the same emotional roller coaster ride with my words that I could do with my actions and my moves inside the ring. So now you get enough experience and enough life behind you and talent to be able to marry those two things so that you can talk people into the arena through your talk, but then you can get to the ring and have the type of match that's going to get them energized and excited about it so they believe what you just got through telling them. So now when you come out and you cut a promo, man, it's got some energy, it's got some excitement to it, it's got some volume to it, the match matches it, and now that's what makes a main event star. Yeah, very true. And you're right, you do need some seasoning too. I mean, you can't just be young i think that's a mistake that they make to think that you're going to put the young guy and put a title on him the title doesn't make the guy the guy makes the title 100 percent, i agree with that 100 percent. And, and i do think that we're going to see more and more of the business get back to where people are not drawn to just the brand they're drawn to the worker you know i think we need some draws back in the business uh, the hogan's yeah. the austin's of the world yeah the rocks absolutely there was a time when people went to see WrestleMania because they wanted to see who The Rock's going to wrestle next or who Hogan's going to wrestle next or who, like you said, Austin's going to wrestle next. And that was the draw, and that's what they bought tickets for. And now they've been able to rely on the fact that people are just buying it for the WrestleMania spectacle. Okay, that's well and good uh, until more talent starts coming up. And, and I think as you see this new talent emerge, and that's what makes it so exciting to watch the renaissance of wrestling. This renaissance of wrestling is taking place. And talent is emerging from that. And somebody from that is going to come out of a main event draw. They're going to capture just the imagination of the wrestling fans. And watching the product right now, and I'm watching it now more than I ever have before. I'm still not watching it religiously, but I'm watching it more than I ever have before. And I don't know who that next person is going to be, but it's amazing to watch it take place and watch it evolve. Um, it's a different animal now, but uh, I like the fact that I, I see a hybrid emerging, and I may be wrong on this, and I'm certainly not a student of the game, and I'm certainly not somebody that's a third-generation wrestler and have watched it through all these different uh, cycles of the business being up and the business being down, but in my gut, what I see taking place is this beautiful hybrid of technology and this new generation of wrestling combined with the old school mentality of the territorial days, right? I mean, why did the territorial days work? The territorial days work because you can make money in your region. And you can make money in your region because local TV had to use local shows to fuel their local, you know, uh, affiliates and, and whatever their, their uh, lineup was going to be, right, that they're showing on local channels. And part of that was wrestling was able to slide in there and fill that gap and that allows you to build a regional territory. Well, I think in some of the same ways, you have that same model existing now, only you get to do it on a national basis to a wider audience because you can do it through streaming services, or you can do it through YouTube, or you can do it through something else, and you don't have to go to a television station and beg them to put you on their, their lineup. You can just create a space for yourself, and if you have a good, if you have good content, good production quality, and you can draw the fans in, then you can make something out of 
very little. <laughs> and it doesn't take much to do it as long as it's done right because you have so many options from a technological standpoint. So I could almost see a resurgence of calling it the territorial days is probably not completely accurate, but I think you know what I mean in that I could see a lot of smaller companies being able to pop up and sustain themselves financially because there's a market that they can find their own little niche in. I'm seeing that right now with Game Changer Wrestling. They're like a yes. you know, number three promotion, if you will, but exactly what they're doing, and they're doing it really, really well. Brett and the crew over there are dominating right now as far as being on that level. That's exactly right. And even even if you want to go even lower than that, man, and you see what they're doing over in Atlanta with NWA, I'm, I'm a, I like watching that throwback, uh, you know, set design there where you're just in yeah. studio and it's studio wrestling. You know, I like that there's a spot for that. Why is there not a place for that in the business? There is. And if you, the whole point of having that type of an outlet and having that type of a platform, if you're game changer wrestling, for instance, well, you're getting enough eyeballs on you now that all it takes is that one talent to come out there and pop that. And if he pops that territory, for lack of a better way of putting it, and suddenly people get drawn in and they catch the mystique or the fire of whoever that talent is, now, suddenly, that goes from just being a number three engine that could to being a big, viable, national, worldwide company. Absolutely, yeah. So, obviously, TNA Impact is much smaller now. But back in the day, were you supposed to stay at TNA for longer? Like, it was like a cup of coffee. What happened with TNA? Did you not want to stay there? Did you not like Jeff? What's going on? Well, here, here's the honest to goodness truth, and and this is this goes back again to me being naive and me being young and me not knowing the business. I made the comment to uh, you know not to plug other shows on your show, but uh, <laughs> I know Conrad. Being an Alabama boy, I know Conrad Thompson, right? Right. And so Conrad and I will talk from time to time. And, Good old and Connie. I made the yeah. Well, as soon as Connie started doing the show with Jeff Jarrett, you know, and getting to hear Jeff and him walk through those early years of TNA and talk about it and everything else. And, and me looking at it from my perspective, coming from the bitterness of, hey, you're going to harbor a little bit of bitterness. If you go through what I went through in WWE and you come out the other side and you feel like you're never even given an opportunity and you sign this new contract and you take less money and they send you up to Cincinnati and you think you're going to be there for four weeks and you're there for nine months and you never even have a dark match. And so you're bitter and you're a little out of shape. And you feel like nobody values your – and nobody, by the way, can make you feel less about yourself than this wrestling business when it's not going well. Hmm. <laughs> when it's not going well and you're not getting opportunities and, and you feel like you've lost your luster, man, you can get really, really low really, really quick. And when I went to TNA, that's kind of where I was mentally. And I was just – I needed a win, man. And I needed it almost too desperately. And I would go up there on my own dime and I'd drive up to – Nashville because it wasn't that far from about four hour drive from where I live in Alabama. And I'd go up there on Wednesdays, man, and I I would hang around the locker room about like I hung around it uh, when I went to Orlando because that's all I knew. You hope somebody gives you an opportunity and then you make the most of that opportunity. And I knew Jeff from WW, WCW and we had a great relationship there. I felt Jeff was one of my buddies, you know, as far as a locker room buddy is concerned, as far as a work buddy is concerned. I didn't spend a lot of time with him outside the business. But, man, when we were around each other and we saw each other, we got around, got along great. Whenever I had a chance to hang out with him, I felt like we had a good rapport. So I thought I kind of had a built-in in up there. In the very first TNA show, I was on it. And, uh, in fact, I sat down and talked to his dad, talked, down, talked with Mr. Jarrett, with Jerry Jarrett a little bit about my character. I felt like he liked the idea of my character, uh, being the raging Cajun and all that deal. But just nothing really ever came of it. I had one or two matches. I was on that very first match. And I think a lot of it just had to do with the fact that I looked like a used-up piece of wrestler that his best years were behind him in WCW. I always looked older than I really was or looked like I was a, more of a veteran than I really was. WWE had not really used me well. I, I don't think I looked like that fresh, young buck that they needed that was hungry for the next new thing. I thought that I was, and I thought I should have been given a better opportunity there. But, man, I listen to Jeff's perspective when he lays things out in that podcast, and I see how things were from the reality of being in that position where you are the guy and you got to make this promotion work. 
And man, I, I certainly don't fault him for not giving me more of an opportunity. I probably got a little bitter about that at the time. You know, I felt like I was going up there every week and that I should have been given more of a chance than I was. Like there was a situation where I'll tell you a couple of quick, funny stories was uh, once I came up there and I was trying to give Jeff the impression that, man, I'm ready to just uh, contribute in any way that I possibly can. And I said, I like to do artwork. I can do T-shirt designs. I'll do whatever, you know, a young up and coming company like this needs. So he asked me to do some you know, mock-ups and bring them up there and we'll take a look at them. And I did that. And nothing ever came of that. So I felt like that was a wasted effort. And then he told me once, he said, well, Dutch is doing, Dutch Mantel is doing a lot of the book. You bring Dutch a tape. So I took a couple of weeks and put a tape together of my best WCW matches, brought it up, gave it to Dutch. Dutch looked at the tape, looked at me, and goes, Hell, Elijah, I know what you can do. Why are you bringing me a tape? And that's what Jeff told me to. You know, that was kind of a wheel spinning scenario I felt like I was in at the time. And I look at it from Jeff's perspective, now being an older guy and recognizing, hey, I wasn't the center of the universe there. I was worried only about me, but Jeff had to worry about an entire company, man. And obviously, he was making the right decisions because they became what they became. And I would love the opportunity to sit down with Jeff again and really, you know, apologize to him for not bringing more to the table than what I did. You know, I think I probably could have made a difference or I would like to think that I could have. And both of our, you know, and made a difference for TNA and made a difference in my career. But I wasn't smart enough to know that. And so. Uh, to get back to the conversation I had with Connie early on when he was doing that podcast was the more I listened to Jeff talk about the business from the perspective of a promoter and a booker and somebody that's responsible to the, for the day-to-day -day operations versus just being a talent, the more I heard that, the more I realized I didn't know the wrestling business. We were never taught the wrestling business. Right. We were taught how to wrestle and how to work and have great matches and we were taught psychology, and we were taught about a lot of things as far as going out there from a performer standpoint. But I realized how little I knew about the wrestling business. And I wish that I had learned more about the wrestling business so that I could have recognized the opportunity that a place like TNA would have afforded to a 26-year-old Lash LaRue instead of going off and going, okay, well, there's another loss. There's another L in that, in that column instead of, uh, instead of a W. And because of that, you know, I didn't go and I wasn't aggressively pursuing Japan because I was thinking, well, if TNA is not going to use me, Japan's not going to use me. You know, I'm floundering on, on a few independent shows here and there. I go into a couple of tours in Germany, you know, that sort of thing. But nothing of substance after that. And I just start getting a few more injuries and enough in energy Enough injuries will accumulate to where you think you have a pretty good excuse for retiring. Yep, for sure. And it really has as much to do about, hey, I don't have the momentum I used to have if you, when you're honest with yourself as it does with injuries. Now, were you upset about Alabama losing to Georgia? Was that, did that bother you? Not at all. Not at all. Now, and I'll tell you the reason why is because, again, I'm an Alabama boy through and through, man. I grew up here, so what that means for me is – I get to be an Alabama fan because I was there for all the bad years as well as the yeah. good years. Yeah. And so thinking that Alabama would even win another national title in my lifetime was amazing for us to have become the dynasty that we have, man, I don't expect to win every year. Now we, we've become spoiled in that regard. I love consistency in, in a, a standard of excellence and Alabama still, even in losing, has not lost that standard of excellence. Everybody expects them to reload and come back the next year. And, hey, that's who I want to be in my life. You know, I want to live my life with that same uh, philosophy where I trust the process, man. If I do good and I be good, I may not win every single match that life throws at me, but, man, overall, I'm going to be a winner. And I'm going to have that character and I'm going to have that drive that's going to take me to the next level. Um, I really firmly believe in that, and that perspective now is more – uh, forefront of my life than it's ever been. Uh, I think I hit a turning point at about 40, to be honest with you, Paul. And then make it a little bit personal again. Uh, I retired early, 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 way earlier than I should have. I retired about 2010 from wrestling. When I turned 40, about 2000, I guess that would have been 16 or so. Uh, I turned 40, I was 300, 
and 18 pounds. Wow. I had about a 44 inch waist. Uh, I was taking a lot of medication to cover up some, some back injuries and, and was just uncomfortable and unhealthy. If you look at a picture of me back then at 318 pounds, I look like Lash ate Lash. I look like a rusting, uh, <laughs> I look like one of those Russian nesting dolls, you know, where you open it up and there's yes. a small one inside, inside, inside. And I thought to myself, man, this is not sustainable, you know, and it's just not. And so I decided to start losing some weight. And all I did, man, was start watching what I was eating a little bit more, just becoming a little more strict and a little more strict. Started stretching out, getting my flexibility back. Started working. I started uh, doing planks at night, just trying to do a little something, man. And it took me about a year and a half. And in a year and a half, I lost a hundred pounds. And I went from uh, from about two from about three sixteen down to about two sixteen. And then I started going back to the gym again, man. I fell in love with working out again. And I'm leaner now uh, at two hundred and twenty eight pounds which is roughly what I stay around than I was when I wrestled. You know, I'm in the best shape of my life. I'm happier than I've ever been. I got a lot of stuff going for me, a lot of business ventures, a lot of irons in the fire. And I attribute it all to just being, uh, having a good balanced life. You know, whether I'm wrestling or not, I want to be in shape and I want to be healthy. Uh, I want my professional life hitting on all cylinders. And more important than any of that stuff, I want my spiritual life to be in order. I want to have that house in order. I want to have that bed made every morning so that I can start my life off the way that it needs to start my day off in a positive way. What can I accomplish today that's going to take me to the next level? That's pretty amazing, though. Uh, best shape of your life, you know, getting, you know, 45, you've been the best shape of your life. But, wow, I can't believe you were that heavy. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was. I was, uh, I was 316 pounds, man. I was huge. The biggest I'd ever been in my life. It's hard to believe, you know, thinking about yeah. you know, Lash LaRue, the character, and then that. You're like, wow, that's crazy. Well, you know, you can actually, uh, when, I, when, I, when I went to the ministry in about, let's see, uh, I want to say it was about 2013. Uh, I went to ministry 2011, about 200, 2013, I was ordained. And there was a local newspaper that did a story on me. And this one of the first images that pop up, actually, if you Google my name now, and I'm heavy in that, man. You can see a lot. I'm probably 280, 290 in that picture. And I literally went from about a 46-inch waist down to I'm back at a 32 now. Wow. Nice. Look at that yeah. dedication. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really what it comes down to, man. It comes down to who do you want to be, and then you're going to be dedicated, and you're going to be consistent day in and day out. So as we hit the wind down, we head towards the finish. I always like to say almost like a YouTube playlist where somebody literally just can pull up YouTube and put Lash LaRue versus. So who was like favorite matches or maybe favorite opponent that somebody could say, hey, yeah, I remember Lash. Like, let's see how good he was. And then put the playlist in of all the wrestlers you would, you know, put on there for a fan that maybe wasn't as familiar. Uh, Billy Kidman, uh, Disco Inferno, definitely the Halloween Havoc match against Disco Inferno. It's one of the tops. If you can find that Billy Kidman, that first Nitro match is a phenomenal one. I'm trying to think of any other ones that I've actually seen on YouTube. And it's funny because, uh, not to skirt the question, but I have found that the older that you get, man, you had so many, I had so many matches in such a short amount of time. Ever so often, I'll work off some on, on YouTube, and I'll forget that I even had that match. <laughs> like I won't even remember that match, so I'm watching it back. Yeah, yeah, and and I'll even see things in the match. So I go, I don't remember that I did that as a thing, <laughs> you know, that that was one of my moves. Uh, those were always good matches, though. Those those two guys always felt like I had a good match with uh, Chavo. I had some good matches with Chavo, uh, Rey Mysterio. Uh, oh, uh, if you can ever find the Kurt Hitting match, I had a great match with Kurt Hitting and a good match with Scott Hall. I was always real proud of those. Those those took place when they did a WCW heavyweight title tournament. And I actually progressed through that. Um, let's see, I think I beat Ernest Cat Miller, beat uh, Mr. Perfect Kurt Henning, and then uh, and then got beat by Scott Hall. 
in the semifinals or something like that. I thought I never should have made it that far or that deep into the tournament. That was when they did that crazy 32 man WWE. Yeah. Tournament. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's but right. been a little too many guys in that tournament, but that was crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no question. No question. So, as far as Brad Armstrong, kind of a uh, really good for was a really good friend, was a mentor. You and Dr. Tom obviously make that pilgrimage. Do you guys still do that every year? We sure do. We absolutely do. And, uh, you know, the way that I look at Brad is that Brad was so influential in me. Uh, Brad was such a phenomenal talent. The most talented wrestler I've ever been around in my life, man. Smooth as silk. I, I think a lot of what made me kind of wander away from wrestling and what made me lose a lot of my passion for wrestling happened around the same time we lost Brad. Uh, that was very, very hard on me. Um, I think that kept me away from the wrestling business. That certainly led to me being a bit of a hermit where for about 10 years, nobody even knew where you could find Lash Peru if you were looking for him, you know, and uh, Brad was just such a top. And Brad was one of those kind of guys that everybody loved him. Everybody admired his wrestling ability and, and everybody enjoyed his sense of humor. But as a person, everybody loved it to such an extent. I say the same thing to, to Dr. Tom now. And I, and I told him even at the time that I would never claim to be Brad Armstrong's best friend because Brad had a lot of friends. But dang, he sure was mine. He sure was mine. Yeah, Dr. Tom says that too. Yeah, he was definitely mine. And, uh, you know, uh, here, here's here's one that's really, really cheesy, but this is absolutely the truth. And this is um, the way I felt about Brad. Um, there's a scene in Tombstone, the movie. And I, I know you've seen it because everybody's seen Tombstone, yeah, right? Well, the movie, yeah. And it, yeah, it's just a phenomenal movie. And it's, it has so many great scenes in it. And uh, which, by the way, you can always tell when the movie is a great movie when it can be cheesy. And it still hits you in your heart, even when it's being cheesy. And if you remember, uh, you know, Wyatt Earp goes out and he's he's trying to chase down all the men that killed his brother. And Doc Holliday goes out there with him, you know, and he's part of this posse. And Doc's out there and, and they're, they're living off the land and he's sleeping on the ground and he's coughing constantly into that white handkerchief and there's blood all over it. And one of the guys out there with him says, Dang it, Doc, why are you even out here? He said, well, because Wyatt Earp is my friend. And the guy goes, hell, I got lots of friends, Doc. And the guy looks back at me and goes, I don't. Great That's story. the way I felt about Brad. That's the way I felt about Brad. Brad was one of those guys that was one of my very, very few true, deep friends. Not just a work acquaintance, not just somebody I got along with, man but somebody that I would invite over to my house and have steak and, and eat with my family. And by the way, I feel that way about all those Armstrongs, but I was particularly close to Brad. Every one of those Armstrongs were good to me. And, uh, you know, uh, shared a little bit of my heart there. So I'll leave on a little bit higher, funnier note, the way that I first met the Armstrongs and, and really got in with them and traveling with them and, and learning from them was, uh, as a young 21-year-old guy or however old I was when I first got on the road with WCW, all I knew was that they were giving me a shot. I get to travel now I'm on the road. Man, this is awesome. I've never been outside of Alabama, and now here I am, a WCW superstar traveling the world. And so I want to look as professional as I can. I want to look like I belong because I'm thinking to myself, any moment now they're going to realize that I'm just some young kid that's got no business being on the roster. <laughs> and, uh, and the first time I was on the road, I Flew into an airport in Strange Town. I don't remember what town it was. I get off the plane. I had not done any preparation at all. I just kind of was trying to fake my way through it. And I walk up to the counter and I go to rent a car. I had no clue that they wouldn't rent a car to somebody under 25. Yep. So now I'm stuck in an airport, can't rent a car because I'm too young to rent a car. And I'm supposed to be at this wrestling show that night. It's going to be on live TV. And Scott Armstrong thought that was the funniest thing in the world. Scott and Steve Armstrong were on that loop, man. And, and I think Nick Patrick may have been as well. And they let me jump in and travel with them. And I always was either traveling with an Armstrong or Nick Patrick 90% of the time when I was in WCW. That's great. Love that. So 
that's a great uh, ending point, I guess. But before we let you go, where can everybody find you? Like social media, your drawings, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the tunehands.com is the website where they can book me to do caricatures or they can email me directly. You know, if they've got a, uh, an event in the Southeast that they want me to draw caricatures at, I do a lot of live events for that. Um, and that's my email address is last WCW at AOL.com. <laughs> the same one I've always had for 25 years or so. And uh, now I'm on Twitter. Uh, you know, I think the last time you and I talked, I didn't have any social media. I'm limited to just Twitter, but that's what I'm on. Uh, I, I bit the bullet and I'm on there at Lash Can Draw. Nice. At Great Lash Can Draw is my handle on there. Yeah. You know, for everybody that thought, yeah, for everybody that thought that Lash Peru would never draw a dime, now I'm proving that I can draw a dime and then some. <laughs> Good point. Yes, that's true. Yeah. And hey, check out uh, my. Uh, avatar or whatever you want to call my drawing that's you you drew that i love that so thank you for that yeah, we're gonna, yeah man we're gonna have to bump that up a little bit for you we need to upgrade that all right and i'm then, down with that do the one for you brother yeah all right. all right i'm down with that but lash thank you so much for all the time really appreciate it hey man thanks for having me again it's been a blast like always